Warning, warning, warning. 112263 may be hazardous to history. Warning, 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 warning. Was Oswald in the Window by Earl Gotts, the Dallas Morning News, 1978. Was Lee Harvey Oswald one of two images filmed moving in the sixth floor window about six minutes before President John F. Kennedy was shot? Or was Oswald up in the sniper's nest at all? Two witnesses have said Oswald was in or near the second floor lunchroom of the Texas School Book Depository just before and after the shooting. He would have been pressed for time to run up four flights of stairs, take aim, and score two direct hits and run back downstairs. A third witness told the FBI she saw two men, one with a gun, in the double window of an upper floor of the depository about the time the Charles L. Bronson movie camera filmed two images moving in the sixth floor window. She said the FBI tried to dissuade her by suggesting she only saw boxes. Mrs. Carolyn Johnson of Stephenville, Texas, told the news last week that she saw Oswald in the second floor of lunchroom as she was on her way out of the depository to watch the presidential motorcade on November 22, 1963. She left the building at 12.25 p.m., she said, or five minutes before the assassination. This was the approximate time Bronson was filming the two images in the sixth floor window. The Warren Commission said no depository employee saw Oswald after 11.55 a.m. Policeman Marion Baker and depository manager Roy Truly met Oswald in the doorway of the same second floor lunchroom at 12.32 p.m., only two minutes after the assassination. The question arises whether Oswald ever left the lunchroom. Mrs. Johnston, then Mrs. Carolyn Arnold, was secretary to the Depository Vice President O.V. Campbell. She said she had never read the FBI reports of two interviews with her. She was surprised to learn they had made no mention of her sighting of Oswald in the lunchroom. Mrs. Johnston said she would have thought she told the FBI during both interviews of her encounter with Oswald in the lunchroom because that's the only time I remember having seen him on the day of the assassination. I do not recall that he, Oswald, was doing anything, Mrs. Johnson said. I just recall that he was sitting there in one of the booths on the right-hand side of the room as you go in. He was alone as usual and appeared to be having lunch. I did not speak to him, but I recognized him clearly. She knew Oswald because he would come to her desk on the second floor and ask for change, never accepting pennies, but only nickels and dimes. The FBI report of her first interview four days after the assassination stated that she left the depository and stood about 30 feet in front of the building to watch the motorcade. She thought she saw a fleeting glimpse of Lee Harvey Oswald standing in the hallway of the first floor. Well, that's completely foreign to me, Mrs. Johnston told the news. It would have forced me to have been turning around back to the building when, in fact, I was trying to watch the parade. Why would I be looking back inside the building? That doesn't make any sense to me. Another witness, Arnold Rowland, said he saw a man standing in the sixth floor window holding a rifle across his chest at 12.15 p.m. He said he also saw from his vantage point on Houston Street, less than a block east of the depository, another man on the same floor but in another window. Rowland said he spotted both men when no depository employees were supposed to be on the sixth floor. This indicates how Roland saw the two men before Mrs. Johnston saw Oswald four floors below. His time was accurate because he recalled he saw the men just as a nearby police radio delivered the message that the motorcade was at the Cedar Springs location. The police radio log shows the presidential car passed that point between 12.15 and 12.16 p.m. Roland first publicly told his story about seeing a second man on the sixth floor less than three months after the assassination. Testifying before the Warren Commission, he was asked why he hadn't told the same story to the FBI in several interviews. He said that he had. At the same time I told them I did see the Negro man, they, the FBI, told me it did not have any bearing or such on the case right then. Roland said, 
In fact, they just the same as told me to forget it now. They didn't seem interested at all. They didn't pursue the point. They didn't take it down in notation as such. Roland's gunman was white and was standing in a partially open window at the southwest corner of the building. The Negro man was at the opposite end of the floor in the southeast window filmed by Bronson nine minutes later. Mrs. Carolyn Walter of Dallas was standing alone on Houston Street near Roland when she saw two men, one of them holding a gun in an upper floor double window of the depository about the time that Bronson was filming the images in the sixth floor window. One of the windows was partially open and she said she thought it was either the fourth or fifth floor directly below the window noted in Bronson's photos. Bronson's film, however, showed that none of the windows up and down the southeast corner of the building were open at 12.24 p.m., except the one which the images were filmed. He, the man with the gun, seemed very casual, Mrs. Walter said. That's why it didn't scare me, I guess. The gun was angled downward toward Houston Street. He was holding it with both hands and, like I say, casually. Not that he was actually aiming or pointing. The motorcade at that point was about six minutes late and should have been coming down Houston Street toward the depository building. Both Mrs. Walter and Roland said they weren't alarmed at seeing a man with a gun because they thought that he was either a Secret Service agent guarding the president or a security guard. Roland said that his gunman wore a light-colored shirt, which could fit the description of the white t-shirt Oswald was believed to be wearing at the time. Mrs. Walter, however, said her gunman was wearing a dark brown suit, and the other man in the window had on a light-colored shirt or jacket. They, the FBI, tried to make me think that what I saw were boxes, Mrs. Walter said. Now, the boxes are much lighter colored, and this definitely was the shape of a person or part of a person. I never read their report. I talked to them, and it seemed like they weren't very interested. They were going to set out to prove me a liar, and I had no intention of arguing with them or being harassed. I felt like I had told them all I knew, and I had relieved myself of the burden of it. And if they did not want to believe it or had some reason not to, well, then that was all right with me. Neither Roland or Mrs. Walter could identify either of the men in the window as Oswald. Neither saw the shots being fired. Again, this is the Dallas Morning News, 1978. Let's just add one very vital piece of information. Barry Ernest wrote The Girl on the Stairs, a book that is very important. Because the FBI and the Warren Commission said Oswald came running down the stairs and into the lunchroom to be confronted by Marion Baker and Roy Truly. The only problem is that three women were coming down the stairs, one of them Vicki Adams. The timing of their flight down the stairs would coincide with the time that Oswald had to have run after shooting the President of the United States. Here's Barry Ernest. In his book, he casually mentioned a witness by the name of Victoria Adams, and that sparked my search for her. It was a very interesting story. She was a witness on the fourth floor of the building and came down the back stairs following the shots, an innocent story at that point, but it seemed incomplete to me, and so uh, that's what, what got me into looking into her side of the story. Did you find her, Barry? I did. It took 35 years. It was a very difficult search, uh, only because she did what she said she did, and that was in conflict with what the Warren Report wrote about her. And when she read her testimony, Eventually, years later, in the 26th volume, she realized that they had altered her testimony somewhat. She saw the writing on the wall based on that and, and pretty much went into hiding. She had left Dallas by the time I arrived here in early 1968 in search of her, and uh, there were no forwarding addresses. Every place I looked for her, every clue that I, I uncovered about her seemed to lead nowhere, uh, and she... Uh, couldn't be found, actually. I, I had a detective looking for her. I had various search banks looking for her. And I, 
I couldn't find her anywhere. She had moved about, left no forwarding addresses. She, she, she played it very low key. She didn't even tell her best friends about what her background was. And uh, therefore it was an easy thing to do because the Warren Com Commission basically wrote her off in two short paragraphs and uh, there was no way of corroborating any evidence that she mentioned in her testimony. And, and so she was basically ignored for the most part, and if she was mentioned at all in any of the books, it was usually in a very critical fashion. But as soon as she brought up the fact that she had run down, ran down the stairs seconds after the final shot, moments after the final shot, then they were all ears. Uh, that seemed to bother them. She said she couldn't understand why, but they continually asked her about those questions. When the Warren report was issued, it dismissed her even though um, it didn't do any of the time tests that it has done on other people involving the escape of Oswald, it didn't even mention in the Warren report that the woman, another woman, had accompanied her down the stairs. Her name was Sandra Stiles. We don't find that out until you go to the 26 volumes and examine Victoria Adams' testimony. It never interviewed Sandra Stiles, the woman who accompanied her. It never interviewed either of the two other women who stood at the window. In other words, it didn't do anything to either corroborate or discredit her testimony other than saying that, one, she was wrong and never came down the steps at that time, actually came down the steps later, uh, and two, had somehow misrepresented the time that she had come down uh, and, and actually descended after Oswald had already passed the fourth floor. There is plenty of evidence, plenty of witness testimony. Um, now the House Select Committee acoustics evidence suggesting that a shot did come from the grassy knoll. The significance of, of her motion was that Oswald was on the sixth floor, according to the government, and descended those same back stairs get away right he he went down those back stairs he ducked into a second floor lunchroom and was confronted by a Dallas police officer named Marion Baker and the depository building manager Roy Truly who had come up from the first floor both had been outside Mr. Baker was in the motorcade and Mr. Truly was on the front steps of the building they had run inside and were attempting to get to the roof of the building where Marion Baker had seen pigeons fly up and thought something had occurred there. It was on the second floor that they confronted Oswald in the lunchroom. Uh, Baker seeing him through a little window in the doorway and going in and confronting him. It was Roy Truly then who said he's an employee, at which case Baker holstered the gun that he had stuck in Oswald's uh, stomach and they both continued up to the roof simple enough pattern, except for the fact that Victoria Adams was now saying she came down the stairs when she said she did, and she neither saw or heard anyone on those stairs at that time. Uh, ironically, the Warren Commission said that if she is telling the truth, she should have seen or heard Oswald. It admitted that, that if she was telling the truth, she should have seen or heard Oswald, and the logic was simple because she had not seen and heard Oswald, then she is the one who is wrong with the timing. I think the significance of Victoria Adams and, and what she did is shown by what the Warren Commission did to discredit her. It, it clearly had an agenda, and Victoria Adams presented a thorn in the side of that. What I found with Dorothy Garner is that she was completely unaware of the controversy surrounding Vicki Adams. She had no idea why I had written a book about her employee, uh, which to me was a good sign because she hadn't been uh, force-fed anything, she hadn't been swayed by anything. This was a, a very fresh interview with her. And she confirmed for me a number of different things which you do not find in the Warren Commission or its evidence. And one was that, that she was at the window with Vicki Adams and Sandra Stiles, that she did see both of them leave very quickly after the shots were fired. And here's the key element. She followed both of them 
out the rear door of the office and across the fourth floor landing as they entered the stairs going down. And then she stayed in that position for some reason. And two things as a result of that. She saw the policeman come up the stairs after Vicki had gone down the stairs. And the second thing is she was very adamant in saying that she did not see Oswald come down the stairs after Vicki and Sandra Stiles had gone down the stairs. What does this mean? Well, if she saw Sandra and Vicki go down the stairs and then saw the policeman and Roy truly come up, Oswald already had to be in the second floor lunchroom if that encounter had, had occurred at that time. Obviously, if she saw Baker and Truly come up the stairs, the encounter had already occurred on the second floor, which meant that Oswald would have had to go down the stairs prior to Vicki and Sandra being on the stairs, which was, according to Vicki, within 30 to 40 seconds following the shot. She did not see Oswald come after the stairs or come down the stairs after all of this had occurred. I think it's important to have Yule Wesley Frazier once again describe another aspect of 112263. Several years I worked uh, for a company called History of America Tours. It's right here in Dallas, and um, and at the last uh, one that we worked together, uh, a man by the name of Josiah Thompson, he had purchased somewhere, uh, somehow he had purchased uh, this Italian rifle, and we were looking at it, and if you if you we did not disassemble it. We measured the stock and we measured the barrel. And there's no way it would fit in this package that they have put in the Warren Commission and they have sold America and the world on. It would, no, it would not fit in there. It's not feasible. The only way it would fit in there was you would have to take it to a gunsmith and they'd have to alter it where you could break it down and screw it together. And the rifle they found in this building was not like that. So it didn't fit in there. How it got in here, I don't know. And I don't think that a lot of people know. Uh, I think they used a word that I don't like, assume. When this all happened, I was terrified. And some people believe in a conspiracy and some don't. Well. You can believe whatever you like. This is America. But I knew that there was people behind this. You best keep silent. And if you stop and think about it, Lee never went to trial. He's the accused. Now, I know a lot of people say he did it. He did it alone. I don't know anybody can prove that. It's a theory. And the thing is, when I went to the war, uh, up before the Warren Commission, they already had their answers. They really weren't interested in what I had to say. And they tried to make me change my testimony. And I ran into one of the sharpest attorneys I've ever ran into in my life. His name was Mr. Ball. And he was good. But I would not accept what he was trying to feed me. I think, I think Lee was a lot more intelligent than they've ever given him credit for. I'm going to play a part of the Dealey Plaza scene uh, where Patch Kincaid, remember this is a sci-fi novel, but it serves a purpose by being a sci-fi novel because it allows Patch to be within a bubble within time to actually see everything in slow motion. And what you're going to see here is Patch walking into the depository and Oswald drinking a Coke in the lunchroom. Chapter 75, 
Dealey Plaza, Dallas, Texas, Friday, November 22nd, 1963, 12.15 p.m. Patch listened carefully to the conversation between a man around six foot five and his friend. Sherry held his wrist as the large man shook his head. Well, he had to be a Secret Service agent. You saw him walking toward Commerce, Philip. That leather and cloth case was a gun case. He was taller than you, John. The gray and white shirt. And with that crew cut, he had to be government. Sherry shook her head. At this point, Patch, I don't trust anyone. Where's this guy now? Patch pinched the bridge of his nose. I'll just lay down in front of the president's car. They started walking up the sidewalk again. Patch slowed when he saw the yellow Hertz sign atop the depository against the silver bright sky. Pigeons lifted off the top of the roof building and circled the plaza. A truck with the lettering Honest Joe's Pawn Shop was parked near the depository. Moon, even if he regained consciousness, would never find them in the crowd. Now turning onto Cedar Springs Road off Turtle Creek. In the distance, the advanced motorcycles moved up Main Street steadily toward Dealey Plaza. Patch gazed up at the building where Oswald worked. A man stood in the far left-hand window. He had something, perhaps a rifle in his hand. Then he backed inside. At the opposite end, a dark-skinned man, resembling Diaz Garcia, lingered by the window. At the far end of the fifth floor, a blonde-haired man in a brown coat passed by the window. Two men fiddled with something in the east window. 12.16 p.m. Near the depository's front entrance, a young man in combat fatigues collapsed in some kind of seizure. He passed out on the pavement. His face had a slight cut, perhaps from hitting the asphalt. A policeman hovered over him, and an ambulance appeared at the plaza at 12.19 p.m., according to the Hertz clock. Another cop remarked to a fellow officer that there had been over a dozen fake calls to the depository in the last couple of weeks. A motorcycle radio sounded. Advise three that the ambulances have arrived and are standing by. On the fifth floor of the corner of the depository, three black men casually waited for the president. Crowd on Main Street in real good shape. They have them back off the curb. The denser crowd also indicated the motorcade would arrive momentarily. As the Honest Joe's pawn shop truck pulled from the depository, Patch and Sherry approached the northern pergolas, white in the bright sunshine across the street from the traffic light. Good shape. We're about to cross Live Oak. Drop back. We have to go at a slow speed from here on now. The hair on Patch's arms tingled with static electricity. As the digits on the Hertz sign changed, cars and people around him slowed. The outside light dimmed as if a cloud had passed overhead. Patch's eyes popped near a guy with a fedora and a lightweight coat at the traffic light. He assumed a dimensional alignment inches off the asphalt. Retrograde now left him helpless to stop the president's motorcade. Sherry's stagnant arms began to rotate. Her face tightened as she looked around at the Houston and Main Street traffic light. Two men were propped up on the pole behind her to get a better look at President Kennedy. The retrograde bubble clogged the time flow as a blink of her eyes took several seconds. Patch's voice echoed inside the dimensional warp. He raised his hands up and yelled, not now, now, now. He stretched out his arms to her, but the smooth dimensional energy enveloped her. Would he be sent away from her to an uncertain future? Again, he ran his fingers over an unseen barrier between the matter outside and his quasi-existence inside the bubble. He turned toward the looming depository. Several policemen and an ambulance up ahead moved ever so slowly away from the building. The crowd had formed like statues along Houston Street and the gray block facade at the Elm Street corner. Behind the crowd, people watched inside the corner windows below the white Venetian blinds. Red letters from the Texas bank sign were held up invisibly against the blue sky down Main Street, and below, the Dallas citizens were several deep inside the curb as the limousine approached in the distance. The long, dark car edged ever closer toward the turn onto Houston Street. A light-colored Ford, the lead car, inched ahead of the two motorcycle cops driving parallel to President Kennedy's limousine. 
In the distance, an American flag and the presidential deep navy-colored flag capped both sides of the limousine's hood. Gridded chrome glistened on the front grill, boarded by two headlights on either side. A Cadillac, packed full of Secret Service agents in black suits, trailed right behind the Lincoln. Patch visualized the long, dark car in his dreams, disappearing in, into the storm across the prairie. Along the road, men and women raised their arms to greet the President of the United States. The President, in a light gray suit, waved in very slow motion to someone on the far side beyond his pink-suited wife. She wore a matching pillbox hat snugly over her thick brown hair. According to the papers, the governor of Texas, John Conley, and his wife sat in front of the president. The driver looked toward the crowd. With a bewildered expression, Sherry mouthed Patch's name as she started forward under a red, white, and blue star cap banner just beyond the traffic light. A policeman holding his white hat raced diagonally to block her path. The cop steered Sherry back into the crowd next to a black woman in a lightweight jacket. Patch again felt his heart thump as the limo moved ever so slightly forward. The depository sign flipped to 12.29 p.m. Kennedy progressed onto Houston Street, seven minutes behind schedule. Somehow from inside the bubble, Patch had to slow or stop that limo. He drifted backward several dozen yards away from the traffic light. Behind Sherry, the advanced motorcycles began a curved trajectory from Main Street onto Houston Street. The people of Dallas smiled and turned toward the corner. Ahead, they lined both sides of the road like fans at a silent game. More than just citizens were on Elm Street. He spotted two men in fedora hats. Both men were familiar, high-level intelligence operatives. A smattering of people, probably employees, had gathered on the front steps at the alcove of the depository. On the fourth floor, to the right, four women watched the parade from one of the open windows. Two dark-skinned men hovered in the corner fifth-floor window. He wondered about Diaz Garcia. As he stood in the middle of Houston Street, he looked left. Past the sign for the Stemmons Freeway, the crowd, some people with cameras, thinned out slightly in front of a sloping grass hill banking the concrete pergolas. Another road across the street paralleled Elm Street and inclined toward the concrete triple underpass. A group of men and a couple of cops stood on the tracks directly above Elm Street. The two lead motorcycles were now actually on Houston Street and gradually faced the depository building. Going through the front depository entrance would be difficult with the crowded doorway. Patch checked over his shoulder. The president's car was not far away down Main Street. He ran forward along the sandstone brick building. He passed between a few parade spectators and the frozen policemen in their blue and gold uniforms blocking Houston Street to the north. To his right, a man resembling Joseph Meltier wore a light shirt and shielded his eyes in the sunshine. Patch had come to believe that Kennedy would be killed here in Dallas, but he never envisioned the wide range of people involved. The shadow of the depository darkened as he rounded the corner of the building a short time later. Out back, open bay doors perpendicular to each other lined the outside dock. The dock area itself was designated in white letters above. Texas School Book Depository Loading Dock. Patch leaped over the dimensional contours outlining the dock stairs and entered the building through an open metal door. Inside, the painted pipes and electrical cables formed a crisscross maze across the ceiling. He spotted an old staircase beyond stacks of cardboard boxes. Inside the narrow stairway, he started upstairs. Upon reaching the second floor, he paused to catch his breath. He leaned into the second floor, built with wallboard and a wood grain door next to a floor safe. A motionless Lee Oswald sat in the booth seats on the right side with his hand wrapped around a glass Coke bottle. He wore a brown shirt with a unique jacket-like lapel collar open over his undershirt. Oswald read a newspaper as he sat at the table. 
For several seconds, with the motorcade coming up Main Street, Patch stared at the back of Oswald's neatly trimmed dark hair. From this area, Oswald could easily go to the first floor and watch the parade. Oswald! He walked around in front of the smaller man. Oswald! Oswald heard nothing as Patch's voice echoed in the bubble. How could Oswald shoot the president from down here? Had Patch changed something again by returning in time? He tried to shake Oswald's coke, but all outside matter remained immovable and smooth. Patch glanced out the rear window. Then he moved past the safe into the stairs. He scrambled up the narrow stairs but turned again. Oswald had begun to lift up the folded newspaper. Patch then grabbed the dimensional edges of the metal pipe banister. On the fourth floor, he observed the four women watching the approaching motorcade in the third pair of windows in the triple underpass side of the building. Anyone coming down those stairs from the upper floors would have been seen by these women, certainly if they descended the stairs after a shooting. He resumed the journey upward. On the fifth floor, three black men ate lunch at the windows. He twisted around and went up another floor. Inside the bubble, he crossed on the new plywood floor toward the window in the corner. He wondered if an assassin had slipped into the building with a floor-laying crew. A slew of boxes partially blocked the exact window above the three men on the lower floor. The elevators were stopped on the fifth floor. To his right, someone had wedged a rifle stamped 7.65 Mauser on the barrel between rows of open boxes and a single box. Was this the rifle that had disappeared back inside the window? He rounded the wall of boxes and a second set of boxes propped to the lower brick casing of the window. One box rested on the brick sill and leaned against the second two boxes. Perhaps the same person had deposited a shell on the floorboard near the bottom box and against the painted bricks. Less than a foot away, a second shell lay identically in the floor crevice next to the bricks. The last shell was diagonally on the floor next to another cardboard box. Had this person thrown a crumpled lunch bag on the wood floor? Patch retreated along the book stacks next to the rear windows. In the lot behind the stockade fence, a white Impala passed a blue and white Oldsmobile station wagon and a black Ford with Texas plates. The man in the Ford had a phone or radio in the car. The driver of the Ford held this mobile unit in his hand. Red mud or dirt covered the paint up to the Impala's windows. The car left the lot. A man in a cocky uniform held a movie camera as he stood between the pergola and the stockade fence. Behind the fence, three men threw something into a red pickup truck. Then they headed for the rail yard. Patch scanned the people on the triple undick pass, but caught sight of motorcycles turning near Elm Street. For some reason, to his right, Three men climbed inside a railroad boxcar. Patch moved to the front of the sixth floor as the motorcade neared the corner. At the open window, he saw the light-colored Ford. The lead car had turned onto Main from Houston Street. Another cop held Sherry at the corner as the Ford passed. Patch retreated above the floorboards and back to the stairs. He thought about Oswald in the lunchroom. following is one of his favorite passages from scripture from the book of Ecclesiastes, the third chapter. There is an appointed time for everything and a time for every affair under the heavens, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot the plant. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to be far from embraces. A time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep 
and a time to cast away, a time to rend and a time to sow, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. I'm leaving 112263 back in history in the dustbin where it belongs. I've been zooming back to the past, 1963. Check out Fitton's Time Travel and all Fitton books at audible.com.